So I want to thank Jeff Howard for being willing to present today on this topic. Of, it has to do with urban mapping and uh, digital soil morphometrics. So Jeff, I would like to turn the webinar over to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, just by way of my background, um, my PhD is from University of California, Santa Barbara in sedimentology. Uh, but I have a background in soils. Um, I have a master's degree in soil science from Virginia Tech, which I completed back in late Pleistocene time. Uh, so I, I do know a little enough about soils, I guess, to be dangerous. But uh, this project um, began in 2012 with funding from the U.S. Geological Survey's uh, educational mapping program, uh, the goal of which is to train the next generation of uh, geologic mappers. And the purpose of this project was to prepare a 1 to 24,000 scale map of the surficial geology of Detroit, Michigan. And this involved mapping parts of the eight, seven and a half minute topographic quadrangles that you see on this map. Uh, coincidentally, in 2012, uh, the NRCS began an update of the Wayne County Soil Survey of 1977, which includes Detroit. And the team leader is Joe Callis, and he contacted me. And we've been working cooperatively together uh, ever since. Uh, I spent the first uh, two years mapping uh, Detroit using the traditional soil auger approach. And what we do is we bore down into the sea horizon, and then we classify our superficial deposits based on texture and the lithology of the uh, superficial deposits. We, we use what the USGS calls a morphostratigraphic approach, where we're assigning our superficial deposits stratigraphically based on their genetic relationship to some landform. Um, pretty much from day one, the big problem that we ran into was excessive artifact content. And uh, we generally had anywhere from 50 to 95 percent auger refusals. And um, Basically, what this meant was that for every hole that we bored successfully through uh, human transported material, we probably had to bore about four or five other ones. Um, that, together with the fact that there was a lot of spatial vari variability in the deposits and just a mind-boggling number of sites, particularly demolition sites, um, it was really taking, it was slow going, to say, to say the least. Uh, about a third of Detroit is uh, vacant urban land. Uh, this is kind of an extreme case. Um, I don't think we could even bore through this. Uh, the, the amount of artifacts depends on what the age and type of building was that was, uh, that was demolished. This was obviously a brick and mortar. Uh, building. The, the spacing on that staff is 10 centimeters. Uh, here's some of our typical demolition site soil profiles. Um, we have demolition sites that have been vacant for decades, in some cases many decades, even up to 100 years. Um, so we have soil profiles without an A horizon, and we see A horizons developed in about uh, 20 to 30 years and becoming progressively more developed from there. Uh, Densic horizons are common. It's very common to see decalcification of the A horizon and calcification of the upper C horizon, which appears to be occurring primarily because of leaching of carbonate from calcareous artifacts especially in the older part of the city where there's been um, buildings from the 19th century demolished and the mortar was made from a hydraulic cement which is more soluble than a, the more modern uh, Portland cements. 
Uh, and also, even in, even downtown, it was fairly common to run into um, buried soils. One day, I was out in the field with Joe Callis, and he was telling me about all the problems they were having. And he said, Dr. Howard, I, I wished I just had a magic wand that I could just wave across the site. And it would tell me the thickness of the fill, the depth to the water table. And he proceeded to list this long list of soil properties that he wished that he could magically obtain. And, uh, and, and we laughed about it. But it got me to thinking that um, there's, there's got to be a better way, some sort of geophysical method that we could use to kind of speed up the, the process. So I kind of focused in on magnetic susceptibility and electrical conductivity as possible methods. Uh, I talked to Jim Doolittle before he retired, and we were trying to um, get together a um, program to uh, uh, try out EC mapping, but that, uh, that didn't materialize. But the, the main objective of uh, the study I want to talk about was to test uh, some field probes, our magic wands, uh, against uh, data collected in the lab from the same site and uh, actual ground truth that we had collected with a soil auger. Uh, so we focused on four um, proximal sensing methods, magnetic susceptibility, uh, electrical conductivity, pH, and penetrability. Uh, we had done a fair amount of preliminary work. Uh, we studied artifacts quite a bit. We looked at them petrographically. We would measured their geophysical properties and electrochemical properties. And uh, we would also studied some urban soils from Detroit. And we were pretty confident that we could at least distinguish between natural or native soils and anthropogenic soils. And it also looked promising that we would be able to distinguish amongst at least certain types of anthropogenic uh, soils. Um, the equipment that we used in the field, we used an Aquaterre EC350 salinity meter, which would measure moisture content, soil temperature, and electrical conductivity. It's a point probe, which we inserted down to a depth of about 15 centimeters. We used the Bardington MS2D surface scanner, which kind of looks like a um, metal detector. It has a disc-shaped detector on the end of it, but you don't have to sweep it across the ground uh, like a metal detector. You can just rest it on the ground surface. And we used the Dickey John Cone penetrometer, which is a point probe. And we tried a metal detector. Uh, we got a pretty good one, um, thinking that uh, you know just metal debris would at least possibly uh, aid in distinguishing between anthropogenic and native soils. I used a team of five students in the field. Uh, each student had their uh, particular tool that they were res responsible for. And let's see if my pointer's, no, my pointer's not working very well. Um, we tried some preliminary experiments with the magnetic susceptibility probe. The, uh, the fellow there in the middle with the uh, striped shirt on and the black bag hanging on, his, on, on, front of, on the front of him has the uh, magnetic susceptibility probe. I don't know if you can see the round disk down on the end of it. Um, we tried using that above the turf layer and versus below the turf layer, and we got a really weak signal above the turf. And also, a problem we ran into pretty quick was high grass interfered, interfered with the surface probe. So um, we first thing we usually did at the site was uh, dig off and lift up the, the turf. And then we made our measurements be 
beginning at about three centimeter steps. Um, the guy in the red hat has the uh, um, metal detector. And my graduate student there, Katie Orl Orlicky, is working that blue box as the electrical conductivity meter. And she's got the uh, penetrometer next to her. And then the fellow there on the right, uh, of course, has the soil locker. Um, we used uh, Mettler Toledo uh, electrical conductivity meter, a Bartington MS2B lab sensor, and a Mettler Toledo uh, pH meter. All of the magnetic susceptibility equipment together costs about 10 grand. And the other instruments were each about 1,000 or maybe 1,500 bucks. So it wasn't super expensive. And uh, we were kind of kind of wanted it to be that way. We didn't, didn't want to have to use really super extensive, expensive equipment. I had a sixth student, and all she did was lab work. So on the left, you can see she's working the electrical conductivity meter, and she's got the pH meter next to her. They're just small little benchtop units, but they're, they're very good. And on the right, you can see uh, the uh, magnetic susceptibility lab sensor. I've actually got two of those. Uh, soil taxonomy does a pretty good job of handling what I call macro artifacts, which are basically gravel-sized uh, particles that are, have been manufactured, modified, or transported to a site by, by humans. Um, this includes um, natural material, can be like coal, could be considered an artifact as long as it's been brought to the site by humans. And this definition matches exactly the definition used by archaeologists. Um, what it doesn't handle very well are micro artifacts, which archaeologists have defined as microscopic particles that are 0.25 to 2 millimeters in size. And particles smaller than that, I just call microparticles. There is a class, uh, ashefactic class, of human altered material and human transported material that's based on a grain count of particles in the 0.02 to 0.25 millimeter fraction, uh, which is typically where fly ash particles uh, um, are found. 0.25 to 2 millimeters, that would be medium to very coarse uh, sand fraction. And my, micro artifacts turned, it, turned out to be important. We, we found they're very common in urban soils in Detroit. And we can identify them, uh, most of them, very well using uh, standard kinds of petrographic methods that we use to identify weatherable minerals or, or rock fragments. Um, and we used uh, reflected light petrography. And we found that micro artifacts varied as a function of uh, uh, land use history. So here you can see kind of a typical assemblage of micro artifacts that we'd find at a residential demolition site. And here's a, an assemblage that we find typically at an industrial site. Um, those mi microspheres that you see there in the middle, um, those are typical of fly ash. And the dark particles there on the left, those are composed of magnetite. So fly ash is highly magnetic, uh, as is steel slag and, of course, any other kind of iron, miscellaneous iron uh, artifacts. And the, the reason why this is important um, is because uh, it, it didn't take very, we found that it didn't take very much in the way of micro artifacts uh, to have an impact on their geophysical uh, signal. And what we did in this experiment was we crushed artifacts and sized them t into the micro artifact fraction. And we got a uh, 
generic sand sample, and we added a known amount of micro artifact to the sand. We, we used 0, 1, 3, 5, and 10 weight percent. And in this experiment, we looked at fly ash, coal cinders, concrete, and brick. And we measured pH, electrical conductivity, and magnetic susceptibility. And the bottom line is what you can see there is you get a significant impact even with less than 5% micro artifact. In some cases, just a couple percent was enough to, uh, to detect. So this might be something so taxonomy want, might want to look at more in the future. Uh, in this study, we, we, we basically carried this out in three parts. Uh, part one, uh, we made transects across um, different uh, land use types. We made three transects. Uh, each one was about six kilometers long and made up of 30 sites, which were spaced about 150 uh, meters apart. And we selected places where we could go across parkland, residential demolition sites, residential sites where we had an uh, undemolished, uh, abandoned, derelict home or other building, and then industrial sites. Um, part two, we made an order one survey at a uh, 1 to 1800 scale of a uh, parcel of vacant land about 1.5 hectares in size. And then phase three was to make an order two survey, uh, a 1 to 24,000 scale map of the whole city of Detroit using these methods. Uh, this is the LIDAR map of Detroit, which was used as a base map for the soil survey. Um, one thing that stands out there is, is that tan area is a broad swell in the ground surface, land surface, called the Detroit Moraine. This is a subaqueous moraine that was deposited um, in glacial Lake Maumee about 14,000 years ago. Um, really not even detectable at the visibly at the land surface. This area has really, really low relief, and the city is basically built on a series of um, uh, glacial, proglacial lake bed plains. The, 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 the areas there in, in tan uh, are lakes that were about 12,400 radiocarbon years old, and the areas in purple uh, are some lakes that existed in latest Pleistocene and early Holocene time. And then the last part of the story is the origin uh, development of the Detroit River, which was at the beginning of early Holocene time, about 5,000 years ago. This is kind of the typical landscape, uh, residential landscape in Detroit. You can see there's a lot of homes being demolished. Some are still in the process of being demolished. Some have been demolished. They don't have much in the way of vegetational cover. Other ones are covered uh, in grass. You've got, uh, adjacent to that, you've got abandoned, derelict, boarded up homes. And you've even got a couple homes that are still occupied that are more or less uh, well maintained. So really a complicated uh, uh, landscape, uh, urban landscape of different kinds of soils. This is the surficial geologic map, a uh, generalized version of Detroit that we, was based on um, a, an auger-based map. And Detroit, uh, I broke Detroit out into basically six different kinds of map units. Um, that red area in the, the, is the downtown, the darkest red area is with the D in it, that's downtown Detroit, which is uh, covered in manufactured, it's manufactured land, covered in pavement and skyscrapers and so on. And it's surrounded by that hot pink area, corresponds to the oldest part of Detroit. 
basically that's the city limits as of about 1905, right before the automobile industry um, took off. That area is um, um, an area of characterized by multiple demolition cycles, uh, largely homes from the 19th century that were demolished. And this would be an area which was probably going to end up on the sort of map being uh, mostly anthropogenic soil series. That's surrounded by the blue area. That whole area in blue, uh, residential zone two, was all built during the 1920s, mainly the late, the mid to late 1920s as a result of the boom in the, in the car industry. Uh, that's an area which is um, basically kind of like what we just looked at in that last slide, where you have a first-generation home built on relatively undisturbed uh, native soil. That's probably going to end up being uh, an area of um, um, native soil series urban land complexes where it's going to be some sort of anthropic phase of a native soil series. The green represents parkland, which could be native soil series, or it could be a demolition site, which is now being used as parkland. The purple areas are cemeteries, which would be characterized by human altered material. And the yellow is industrial land, uh, including railroads. And one of the things that I found that was interesting was usually when we make a surficial geologic map, the first thing we break out is the uh, modern drainage, QAL, because those contacts are going to cross-cut everything older than that. In this case, what I found useful for breaking out first were the railroads. Um, I didn't map the highways, but uh, but the once the railroads were mapped out, everything else kind of seemed to fall in place. You can see the industry pretty much followed the, the railroads. Uh, in the 19th century, most of the um, uh, industrial, industrialized area was along the riverfront. And there in the middle of the map, what's labeled as MJ is the Milwaukee Junction area. In fact, that's where Henry Ford's first car plant uh, was located. He started producing cars in 1905, and by 1910, he had outgrown that and was manufacturing cars, the Model T, up at the Highland Park uh, plant to the north there, labeled HP. And by 1920, he had outgrown that humongous plant and built an even more humongous plant in southwestern Detroit called the Ford Rouge plant, which is where the F-150 uh, pickup truck is still manufactured. That large area of yellow just to the east of the Milwaukee Junction, that's where the Dodge Brothers uh, original car plant was located. And the areas there along the east, uh, labeled CC, the Connor Creek Corridor, that's all uh, Chrysler country extending up through there. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Uh, these are selected results from the transect studies. I indicates an industrial site, P is parkland, D is a demolition site, and H represents a undemolished uh, abandoned house. And one thing that stands out in terms of the field magnetic susceptibility is the strong signal from the industrial sites. Uh, that's due to the abundance of coal combustion uh, products. Um, another thing you can see in B there, that first park, as we made a transect across that, we could see from the auger boings that the ground was increasingly more disturbed, and we got a stronger and stronger magnetic susceptibility signal. So even in the absence of artifacts, magnetic susceptibility was detecting uh, ground disturbance. And that, that was really interesting. And it uh, come to find out, forensic scientists are actually using magnetic susceptibility now to search for 
uh, graves of you know uh, people that have been you know disappeared and have been murdered and, and buried out in the middle of nowhere. And apparently, when a hole is dug or the ground is disturbed and backfill backfilled, you get a increase in the mass of magnetic material versus per unit volume, and the instrument can detect that. Uh, electrical conductivity is really good at detecting waste building materials like uh, brick and concrete and mortar, so it gives a strong si uh, strongest signal at demolition sites, uh, and of course penetrability um, is a good indicator or correlates well with demolition sites, compaction from earth moving equipment. And just to kind of summarize what we found from the transects, um, we were able to dis dis distinguish native or natural soils very well from anthropogenic soils. Native soils had a pH less than 7. Anthropogenic soils were higher. Uh, the EC was less than 110 microsiemens per centimeter. Anthropogenic soils were higher. Uh, Magnetic susceptibility was less than 150 uh, magnetic susceptibility units. Anthropogenic soils was higher. And penetrability was less than 3,400 kilopascals, whereas anthropogenic soils uh, were higher. Uh, this is where we did our order one survey. Uh, if you look in A up there in the upper right-hand corner, you can see a, a runway. We're right next to City Airport, Detroit City Airport, and this was an area that was demolished uh, largely in 1997 as part of a failed attempt to expand the City Airport, which never materialized. If you look on the left, you can see an aerial photograph I superimposed on there from 1947. You can see how many houses were packed in there. Almost all of those houses were built between 1925 and 1930. Just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the car boom, the Dodge Brothers plant was just to the west uh, of here, which is now where Chevy or GM makes the Chevy Cruze. Uh, it, you can also see the Wisner Street site, which is another um, uh, Order 1 survey of a vacant lot that we made, um, which is in, described in my list of publications, which I'll talk about uh, at the end. Uh, we, ma we made the uh, Order 1 survey by making four transects to create a grid of 74 points. These are surfer-generated maps of the area. And uh, you can see electrical conductivity, both field EF is field, EC is lab-based, uh, moisture content, pH. Bottom line is they're all different, <laughs> which I think is, is showing how complicated uh, uh, soil properties are in these in vacant land created by building demolition. Uh, what the, the, the map that matched the auger base map the best was D, the lab-based electrical conductivity map. That cold spot, that blue area there in the middle, was pretty much undisturbed, um, artifact-poor uh, soil. And then, uh, similarly, the uh, TM is soil temperature, PE is penetrability, then we have uh, field magnetic susceptibility and lab magnetic susceptibility. Again, pretty much all unique uh, map patterns. One interesting thing is we knew pretty well the history of this area from aerial photographs. Most of the area was demolished in 1997 as you can see in that map at the top, those areas had an A horizon, whereas the other areas were only recently demolished. They, they lacked an A horizon. And we think we can see that uh, in the um, Order 1 survey. Uh, 
these kinds of geophysical techniques are routinely used by geotechnical consultants to do these kind of uh, site assessment um, surveys. So really all of the, the methods that we looked at at least yielded some useful information uh, for at mapping at a really large scale. And this, th these are the maps from our Order 2 survey. This is electrical conductivity. On the left, those maps are based on undemolished sites. And on the right are based on demolition sites. We map those out separately. The demolition sites, uh, and then in the, in the upper right, you can see the surf surficial geologic map. What we expected was to have relatively undisturbed uh, lower values in the northwest and northeastern parts of the city and the highest values uh, in the south and especially the southwest uh, where there's heavy industry. And the maps that really showed that the best were the undemolished, were based on the undemolished sites, particularly the one in A. And that's the lab-based uh, electrical conductivity map. And one interesting thing you can see there you can see that the what you, overall you can see that the the um, high is centered over broadly over the industrialized part and the older part of the city, but right smack dab in the middle of that is that blue area, which is a low spot. And I think what we're seeing there is fly ash contamination, and there's so much fly ash in that area, which is around the Ford Rouge plant. Uh, fly ash being largely glass, which is an insulator, it's actually creating a negative anomaly. It's really pretty spectacular if that's actually what's going on. These are the magnetic susceptibility maps, undemolished on the left, demolished on the right. The demolition site maps don't really show a whole lot, although G um, does kind of have a hot spot in southwestern Detroit. I think that's uh, because of the demolition sites are old and they've been impacted by fly ash. The maps on the left on the left give a much better picture. You can see the cold spots in the northwest and northeastern eastern parts of the city where we expect, and the hot spots centered over the industrial area extending up across the Milwaukee Junction area and up to the Ford Highland Park uh, plant. Not that I'm pointing any fingers at Ford, but... Um, given that these four different parameters generally increase with increasing disturbance or decreasing soil quality, I thought it might be useful to use these to develop some sort of an overall measure of soil quality. So I called this the anthropogenic map index. And I broke each value down into different ranges and just arbitrarily assigned each range a score. And then I defined the, the anthropogenic map index as the sum of these four scores. So using this method, uh, uh, the ideal native undisturbed soil would have a AMI of 4, and soil quality would decrease with increasing uh, AMI value. So I tested this out using the transects based on you know, known land use types, and the results, the ranking was what you would expect in terms of disturbance. The soils with the poorest quality were at industrial sites, followed by demolition, undemolished, and parkland sites. And then I tried the uh, same thing on the Order 1 area, produced another surfer generated map. Uh, the map on the left is based on AMI. And you can see the area of best soil quality is in the middle of the area. And the, the map that best matched that was the lab-based electrical conductivity map, which I showed you before, which was the map that actually correlated best with auger-based uh, ground truth. So that's an area of relatively sandy soil. Um, 
low in artifacts, which would be the highest quality um, based on the M AMI. So it seems to actually kind of be useful there. And then I tried the same thing using the order two survey of the whole city. And uh, you can see uh, an area of high soil quality in the northwestern and northeastern parts of the city, kind of where we expected to see it, and an area of poor quality in southwestern Detroit where the heavy industry is located. And it's almost a dead ringer for the lab-based magnetic susceptibility um, map. So it looks like it's useful on different uh, scales. Um, just by way of some of the outcomes um, from the Wayne County uh, updated soil survey from, from my point of view, um, one thing that impressed me is just how much more accurate these LIDAR-based uh, soil maps are. Um, the and the uh, landforms and geomorphic micro, micro features just stand out like a sore thumb. And uh, in the um, lower right-hand corner there, you can even see slag piles uh, um, on Zug Island just, just uh, really stands out really well. So I, these maps are just going to be way more accurate than the 1977 uh, maps. It's really a f phenomenal tool. Um, another thing I think the maps are going to show um, when they're finally done is that the, the soil map is going to be similar to the surficial geologic map, of course, because we're kind of mapping the same thing. Um, and these are similar to land use maps, because the land use history and former original settlement pattern is what's controlling uh, the thickness of the fill, the kinds of artifacts, the amount of disturbance, uh, and so forth. And I think the soil map is going to eventually be a mosaic of basically four kinds of map units, uh, native soil series, native soil series urban land complexes, urban land, and manufactured land. And I think the urban land um, component is going to be comprised of basically um, four subtypes. Uh, which kind of correspond to the basic ways that anthropogenic soils are created in the first place. Uh, we can take a pre-existing soil and modify it uh, to create human-altered material. Um, I suspect there's going to be areas of what pe some people have called scalpic soils, where part or all of the soil profile has been uh, stripped off by earth-moving equipment. I, I suspect those are going to be mapped as eroded or anthropic phases of some sort of native soil series. And then we're going to probably have two types of human transported material type soils. Um, in the one case where it doesn't meet the criteria for a buried soil, where the capping is less than 50 centimeters thick, it's probably going to be some sort of anthropic phase of the native soil series. And other places where there is a buried soil, which are probably going to be uh, anthropogenic soil series. And as I understand it, uh, so far, there's only been, uh, it's only been necessary to create four anthropogenic soil series, um, new series, to handle uh, Detroit. So just to kind of wrap things up and summarize, um, one of the problems we encountered was tall grass. Tall grass interfered with uh, the surface scanners. Um, art artifacts interfered with the pointed uh, surface probes, even to the point of even damaging the electrical conductivity uh, meter. The f pretty much all of the field probes and all of the techniques that we investigated were useful for at least in some way, for order one surveying, although it was really complicated and, and you really had to kind of scratch your head as to what was going on. Overall, I think the lab-based electrical conductivity and magnetic susceptibility methods um, yielded better results. Um, 
it's not a magic wand, but still relatively non-invasive. All we have to do is just peel up the turf layer and collect a sample. We really only collected uh, quart-sized samples. We got enough sample to do everything that we needed to do. This is a relatively small amount of soil. And um, we, I think we were able to certainly distinguish between native soils and anthropogenic soils using all four of the characteristics. Um, I think for the citywide mapping, uh, order two uh, surveying or order three, the lab-based uh, electrical conductivity and magnetic susceptibility technique was probably better than the than the than the field probe uh, approach. Electrical conductivity was really good at detecting waste building materials like brick and mortar and concrete, and cinder block. Magnetic susceptibility was really good at detecting uh, magnetic particles like uh, fly ash or coal cinders, steel making slag. And uh, magnetic susceptibility I think was really good for actually distinguishing ashrafactic soil. And I think that's what those magnetic susceptibility maps are showing. It's actually a map showing the geographic distribution of uh, ashrafactic soils. Um, uh, if you're interested in getting more information, I have a list of publications on my website at class.wayne.edu slash jhoward. Uh, if you see any papers in there that, that you're interested in and you'd like a copy of it, you can email me at jhoward.wayne.edu and I'll send you a PDF. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we'll give people a few minutes to compose their thoughts and enter their, their thoughts as a question in the Q&A pod or in the chat, either one. Any questions from here in the room with me? Uh, Jeff, about what kind of depth were you investigating the, uh, the depth of the fill of these uh, man altered or man-made soils? What is the approximate depth? Uh, for for augering, I mean, we tried to go 60 inches. Um, sometimes we, we we weren't able to go, but maybe 30 um, centimeters. Which we tried to go down at least 50 centimeters to detect how how thick the, you know, whether we had 50 centimeters or not. But it just wasn't all, always possible because of all the artifacts. Were you often finding native soils? Underneath the like the residential areas, yes, yeah, yes. below the artifacts. Okay, mm -hmm. very common to see buried soils, even downtown. It was really kind of surprising. And th those were soils that were farmed by the French uh, in the 1700s. Another interesting thing uh, was the abundance of earthworms. Um, the, the, we, we have Lumbricus terrestris, which is the, the night crawler, which, which creates vertical burrows. Those are an invasive species that were brought over by the French and British settlers. And they're prolific in Detroit. They can even burrow down through a densic horizon. It's amazing. I couldn't, I couldn't believe how, how deep these, uh, how these worms could get through that stuff. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. Well, Jeff, I know you talked about uh, some of the size of, of the artifacts, micro-artifacts. And at one time in our field book for describing soils, we were looking at putting in the less than two millimeter stuff. But then it became too hard to separate it from sand, silt, clay, size particles. So in National Cooperative Soil Survey, we've kind of limited it to those fragment sizes two millimeter and larger. Um, any thoughts on how we would incorporate these micro artifacts in, into a description? Um, what, what kind of language can we use to separate those, distinguish them between sand and silt size stuff? Well, I guess um, oh. 
I, I guess it would really just kind of expand um, the um, artifactual and posse artifactual classes. Mm. Um, I haven't really quite thought about that, and I haven't really thought about how that would actually be used in soil taxonomy, but... Um, well, even in just describing soils, I think. Um, sometimes it's hard to have the, the language until uh, to use to, to describe these things. Uh, it's it's not something you could do in the field. I mean, you'll have to um, take them back to the lab and remove the organic matter. Uh, we we would soak them in hydrogen peroxide for about a week, um, and that would usually get clean them up good enough, and then we would sieve them out and just look at them with a reflected light uh, microscope. Mm -hmm. uh, we did I have a question. I got a question yeah. about a metal detector. Um, let's see. Um, so we scanned uh, demolition sites. So the question is, how did you use the metal detector as a tool for mapping? Yeah, we, we basically scanned the ground surface and counted the number of hits. And we compared with uh, parks. And it seemed to work. Jeff, on the on the demolition, was most of that was it the uh, the artifacts that remained were they simply incidental after the uh, demolition had occurred and materials were removed, or was this materials that were demolished integrated into the uh, land surface? Um, it, it it varied, you know, over time, depending on what contractor was doing it. It, it varied depending on. Um, uh, the regulations at the time, and in the old days, they were actually, I, I think, either unregulated. Some some of the, the the contractors actually left artifacts there on purpose, as much as possible, and they called it hardcore, uh, thinking that they were helping pre prepare the site for the next building to be constructed. Okay. Would would this mapping? Uh, lead to any kind of uh, identification of hazardous areas due to some, you know, waste products or whatever? Uh, there's been a lot of work done uh, showing that there's a really good correlation between magnetic susceptibility and heavy metal contamination. So heavy metal or magnetic susceptibility would be a good way, I think, to detect uh, heavy metal contamination. And fly ash very often is the source of the heavy metals. So in a way, we kind of have made a map of uh, soil contamination in Detroit, which I'm scared to tell the city about. <laughs> Well, Jeff, that's exhausted our questions here, and, uh, and as well as those online, I want to thank you for your time and effort to make this presentation today. And thanks to all participants for joining in. We had more than 50 people join today's webinar. The on-demand recording of this webinar will be available on our National Soil Survey Center YouTube channel within a few business days. So please tell your colleagues about this training opportunity. And this concludes our webinar presentation.